Destination Freedom. Destination Freedom, dramatizations of the great democratic traditions of the Negro people, is brought to you by Station WMAQ as a part of the pageant of history and of America's own Destination Freedom. The toughest job in the year 1948 was that of mediator in the blazing dispute between the growing new nation of Israel and the Arab states in Palestine. Inheritor of this job is Dr. Ralph J. Bunch, grandson of a slave and now acting mediator for the United Nations in Palestine. In a chapter entitled Peace Mediator, Destination Freedom tells the personal story of Dr. Bunch. He had come to the wide western edge of Asia, peace plans in his pocket and the permission of the United Nations. He had been told to meet his chief, Count Bernadot, for a conference in Lida between Arab and Israeli. He halted in Haifa, a day behind his chief, and in the hot Palestine noonday, phoned ahead in a desperate effort to pick up his lost time. Operator. Operator, please hurry, please. I am ringing, sir. I am ringing. Are you ringing the right number? I am ringing Count Foke Bernadotte's office in Jerusalem, sir. Count Foke Bernadotte's office? I have a call for the mediator, Count Bernadotte. Sorry, the Count and his aide left for the Jerusalem airport an hour ago. Thank you. They say he left an hour ago, sir. I heard that, operator. Get me the Jerusalem airport, please. I will try to get them for you. Hurry, operator. I am ringing, sir. Central Jerusalem Airport, traffic manager speaking. Listen closely, officer. I'm with the United Nations Mediation Service. So? I'm Dr. Ralph Birch, the assistant mediator here for Palestine. Now, right now, I'm trying to catch up with Count Bernadotte. You know him? Yes. Now, he'll pass by your airport driving. I can't explain how important it is that I get to him before he reaches his destination, before he goes any further. Yes, but Dr. Birch... Now, listen, please. When his car comes by the airport, tell him to wait for me. Don't let him leave before I get there. Monsieur, his car... His car is a grey Chrysler sedan. You can't miss it. But stop him. But, monsieur, I cannot. Why can't you? That car has already stopped here and passed on. Oh. You're just ten minutes late, monsieur. It rolled to twelve outside Jerusalem. Oh, good heavens. Is there any way I can catch him? But he was going very fast. He did not say where. Oh, I know where. I've got to be in that car with him. Well, I have a grey sedan here, too, perhaps. Please, please. I'll be there by plane in a few minutes. Good. I will wait and drive you myself. And far out on road Q-12, four men waited by a cypress tree, and one focused his binoculars on a speck of dust in the distance. Is he coming yet? All I see is a slight cloud of dust, maybe four miles back. Uh, give me the glasses. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a cow, all right. But is it his car? Is it his? I'm not sure. And there's another coming, too, further back. His is a gray Chrysler sedan. Well, both look like gray sedans. Maybe his bodyguard. Huh? Uh, how can I be sure at this distance? Well, the second's too far back to be a guard. And maybe the first is his. Maybe the second. Dr. Well, he's bound to be in one. If not the first, we'll wait for the second. Your gun ready? It's ready. Test it, will you? All right. All right, that's better. Uh, first car's coming ahead. Second one seems to be stopping. Next time, test the gun on the car. The four men stood under the cypress shade, watched the cloud of dust on the road, and in their gun barrels, bullets spent their last quiet moments. But further down the road, the second car came on. Uh, they are up ahead, Doctor. We will catch him in ten minutes. Can't you go faster? I am doing the best the road will allow. What's the matter? We'll stop it. I think there's something wrong. What? Oh, what's the matter? I think I know the trouble, monsieur. The Count's car's out of sight now. It is always like this on a sandy road. The carburetor is clogged. It will take just ten minutes to clear it, monsieur. Ten minutes, and I will have you sitting in your usual place at the Count's side. Just a few minutes. And he took his few minutes and cleared the carburetor, stepped again on the reluctant starter... and 
and moved over the desert road. And this time had no trouble in overtaking the Count's car, for it stood still, dead still. Andre, something's wrong. Here, let me take a look first. Stay in the car. The driver took a long look and came back. You can go there and see if you care to. What happened? The Count has been killed. The man sitting in the seat you usually occupy is dead, too. Ten minutes late kept you alive. Well, who will mediate now, monsieur? He drove slowly back over the ancient road, heartsick and weary. And his fight to bring peace to the Holy Land appeared impossible and hopeless. The news shocked the wires of the world, and the United Nations sent a courier to the assistant mediator. The courier found him late that evening out walking in the Jerusalem streets. Oh, Dr. Bunch. Yes? The Secretary General wired me to contact you here. Oh, I've been told to expect you. And you know what my mission is about. I've got an idea. In all the capitals of the world, they're asking who will mediate now. The United Nations would like to know if you will step into Count Bernadette's place, or at least until a regular commission is appointed. Will you take over what's become the most dangerous job in Asia? If I thought I could really do the job, I... Apparently the council uh, believes you can. For once, they decided unanimously on a man. Why me? They want someone who is familiar with the struggles of colonial peoples and of racial minorities, and who can be trusted by both sides. Someone whose personal experience fits him for the job of peacemaker. We hope you'll think it over. There's not much time. When you're decided, phone me at headquarters. I'll relay the message. You have eight hours to decide. He walked on through the Jerusalem streets, probing the hidden pockets of his mind. And he thought of a day, 28 years back, when as a valedictorian of a Los Angeles high school, he came into a newspaper office and got his instructions from his first boss. Ah, see here, kid, you're valedictorian of your high school, but that don't mean a thing on newspaper row. I'm not exactly going to be a newspaper man, Mr. Ankerby. I know, I know. You got some fool notion about studying government and political science. Well, there's about as much chance of a colored kid around here doing anything with that as there is for you to, uh, say, discover the biggest scoop of the year. I heard you say that before. I'll say it again for your own good. Political science in school's one thing. In the wide world, it's another. Now, look, concentrate on being a good cub reporter. Go around the suburbs. Pick up anything your valedictorian soul regards as news. We probably can't use much of it, but you'll be learning. In a few years, you'll understand more about how the government's really run than all the books in the world can teach you. Now, get out and keep your eyes open. He remembered how he had gone out and kept his eyes open, and day by day brought in news that never touched the papers until the night he walked to town and on a quiet road stumbled upon the biggest story of his life. Oh, oh. He remembered how his toe struck something soft on the ground and he bent low and recognized the town's new grocery man. Mr. Rose! Mr. Rose! Straighten up, kid, and keep your mouth shut. But don't you see him? It's Mr. Rose. You heard what the man said, boy? Shut up! But it's Mr. Rose! I said Mr. shut up! Don't! Shut up! Now, get on down the road, boy. And breathe a word of what you saw to a soul, and we'll use the gun on you. Now get! He had walked on down the road, quiet. But inside, his heart hammered out the story he would tell Editor Inkerby. Mr. Ankerby, I, I, I You're way late, kid. Where have you been? No. Here, take this copy down and compose it. Come on, get the lead out of your feet. No, I, I'm the only one who knows about it. What are you talking about? The murder. Huh? It's true. I saw it on my way here. It was Mr... Now, wait a minute. Come in the office, boy. All right. Close the door. Now, wipe the sweat off. Have you and talk plain? Oh, well, I, I was down in the hollow near the suburb. I saw three men standing over Mr. Rose. You know, he was the new man with the grocery store. I know, I know. He was dead. The man had guns in their hands. Killed Rose, eh? Did you know the man? Oh, I'd know him anyway. One was wearing hey, a... Keep your mouth shut. But I've got to tell you. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know anything about it. 
not my business. But it's for the paper. Not for my paper, no, sir. Some things, boy, you can't mess with. Rose was Jewish, moved into that restrictive covenant area. Them vigilantes have been after him ever since. But he was a citizen. Citizen, citizen, spoken like a schoolboy. So am I. But some citizens around here got more power than others. If I printed that, they'd bust up my newspaper in no time. Of course, if Mr. Rose hadn't been Jewish, there's sort of a gentleman's agreement about things like this. Not enough people to protect me if I fought the vigilante. So look, you keep your mouth shut about their names. You're colored. They'll get you next. And there's nothing in your political science that says you can prove a thing. He remembered how loud his heart had beat then, and how it thundered when he told the police sergeant. Murder, eh? Hey, Casey, you hear this? Suppose we do a little investigating. And the investigation had gone on, and somehow there had been enough people to protect him. And when the criminals were caught, he remembered the mayor had asked to see the bunch boy. If this is the bunch kid that turned in those hoodlums, Your Honor. Says he's not really a newspaper man, but wants to study politics at Harvard. <laughs> I told him it'd be better to study in the first ward in my precinct, but he's hard-headed. Is that right, young man? That's right, Your Honor. I'm disappointed, but I suppose you can use this $1,000 even there. $1,000? Yes, the citizens of Los Angeles have collected $1,000 for you to further your studies in... Uh, Political uh, science. Yes. I don't see why you're studying government. You'd make a good... Uh... The precinct captain, Your Honor. Yes. One of the best. My ward needs one. He remembered how he had turned down the precinct captain's job and didn't tell the mayor how the newspaper job had made him more certain that he had to learn why there was one rule for the majority and another for the minority. He knew he could make his politics a science even if the mayor didn't believe him, or the Harvard professors who gathered after he had finished the course to decide whether he should have funds to go further. Wasting funds on a Negro student to get a doctorate in political science. <laughs> I recommend that this Ralph Johnson bunch be dropped from consideration. Well, no, yeah. no, not, no. Professor, no, no, Professor, no, please. No, 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 no. This student finished highest in his class. I say simply on his record, we've got to consider him for the fellowship. But a fellowship in a field where he'll get no employment will only frustrate him. The city of Los Angeles sent him here to study. He studied. Now let's send him back to Los Angeles. Not all over the world poking his head into this government and that government. Uh, <laughs> what good reason will you give for turning him back? Race? Oh, come now. Face it. Our fellowship fund is for practical purposes. We encourage students to work out their doctorates and subjects that will benefit them. Now, if this Ralph Bunch can be persuaded to study, say, uh, physical education or something more in keeping with his job potentialities... I'll be willing to give him his fellowship. Precisely. No. No. Uh, very well, gentlemen. I'll, I'll call him in and see if he'll change his mind. I'll report to you later. And as he trudged along a silent street in Jerusalem, he remembered how the embarrassed chairman had called him in and explained why he could not make the science of politics his field. As much as we deplore how the world's constructed today... We're practical dispensers of the fund. What are you trying to say, Professor? The, the committee thinks your study of governments is useless. They hope you'll pick something you can put to better use. I see. Now, if you'll take, say, uh, even sociology, uh, we can do something. I see. I think your committee has shown me what I really need to do, Professor. Yes? Whenever a group of men becomes so bigoted... They believe they must limit the field of education to some men. Well, I'm convinced it's my job to study the kind of government that breeds such men, to see if we can change them. Tell the committee I'll study government, even if I don't get the fellowship. And the chairman had gone back to his committee and reported his findings. Gentlemen, I, I've talked to this Ralph Bunch, and it's my belief that we must give him this fellowship to study government even if it kills him. The committee, Mr. Bunch, agrees that they'll make an exception in your case. You've got your fellowship. Study whatever kinds of governments you see fit. Have you decided how you'd like to start? I thought I'd like to start in Africa and Asia. The seats of world governments are in Europe, young man. Yes, I know. 
but those seats are resting squarely on colonies. I'd like to see how they manage to hold those seats. And how will you go about this? Hmm, by living and working in the colonies for the, for the next five years. I've gotten a map of Africa, and, and I've seen how, from its wide northern top to its southern end, the empires of Europe have carved it into little pieces. I'll talk to Africans in the Belgian Congo, the British Sudan, French Morocco, Portuguese, Dutch, and Spanish colonies. And I'll try to enroll in the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh -huh. You came all the way from America to study here in Africa? On a fellowship. I see. We'd have no objection to your entering if we were sure you are here for, uh, for peaceful purposes. What harm could I do? You could spread dissatisfaction among the natives. In fact, our government believes that's why you're here. Are the natives so easily dissatisfied? Uh, natives are always dissatisfied. We'll admit you. But we suggest you stay away from the native quarters. You might be mistaken for one of them. He remembered studying the colonial government that kept eight million people landless, locked in special quarters, barred from the streets and schools, restless and rioting. And he sought them out and talked to their teachers and editors and went with an editor to his hotel. Clerk. Yes, Mr. Bunch? I'd like an extra room tonight for my guest. Is he a Negro? The same as I. I mean a native. He is. The hotels here do not take in native Africans, Mr. Bunch. You'll have to take your friends somewhere else. Yes, he remembered that the natives were unfree in their own land. He lived in the tribal camps and got to know chieftains and learned that people everywhere were determined to have freedom and a control over their destinies. He saw diamond, copper, and coal mines where thousands of Africans worked for a dollar a month, taxed and landless, and understood even better the old urge his own country had once to free itself from the colonial status. He put in five years in the col colonies of Indonesia, Malaya, and Burma, and wrote in his thesis, If ever there is to be peace in the world, the vast majority of mankind who produce the raw material out of Asia and Africa must first be freed and given a proper share of the wealth of their labor. They will either become free and independent new nations through blood and strife, as did America, or through the cooperation of peaceful nations. A very good thesis, Dr. Bunch. It deserves the award you won for it. <laughs> Coming from one who didn't think my study worth anything, I appreciate that. Oh, it wasn't I who thought that. There was a very backward committee... This has brought them forward out of the Dark Ages. In fact, they've come so far that they want you to remain here at Harvard as an instructor in political science. Alone in Jerusalem, wondering whether he should accept the assignment from the United Nations, he remembered the years spent in putting his knowledge before the students who passed through his classes. But he still had wanted to return to his own way of learning his science, by practice. And one day, a Swedish scientist had come to him with an offer for a venture. Dr. Bunch, I'm Gunnar Myrtle. Sociology is my business. Oh, I've heard of you, Dr. Myrtle. Good. Your Carnegie Institute has commissioned me to do a study on American race relations. I've heard of that, too. I believe for an outsider to do such a book, he'd need help. Your help. I need someone to travel with me. Someone who can be not only a scientist and a guide, but a guinea pig. So that I can see clearly the causes and effects of race discrimination. I know your job here is secure and this will be short, but I think it may be worth it. He had thought of its worth as he traveled north, west, and south with the Swedish scientist. And as the Africans had learned in Africa, so he learned the feeling of being unfree in his native land. A cleric? Yes, Dr. Myrtle? I'd like a room for my colleague here, Dr. Bunch. Uh, oh, uh... Well, Dr. Myrtle, your own reservation has been accepted. I uh, understand that, but my colleague, Dr. Bunch... Well, you see, uh, You're new in this country. Uh, uh, very new. Uh, you don't understand. We... We don't accept Negroes in this hotel. 
Then I suppose you don't take foreigners either. Oh, yes, yes. You'll be all right. But your friend will have to go somewhere else. And in towns in Texas and Georgia, Indiana and Maine, they filled in their report. And they listened in a cafe in Alabama when a frightened waiter explained why he couldn't serve them. I'm sorry, but you two can't sit together in the restaurant here. Please leave. Well, what do you mean? Well, the state law says it's illegal for whites and Negroes to eat together in the same restaurant. The last two who got brotherly got 30 days to boot. For white and colored citizens to eat together in this state's a crime. It's just a natural crime. The two left the state where there were penalties against the practice of brotherhood. And when they had covered the country, Dr. Middle wrote, With the help of Ralph Bunch, I have finished my study of American race relations. I have called it an American dilemma. The dilemma is whether Americans are going toward democracy and freedom or backwards to colonial thinking. He remembered how he had been proud of the book and then had gone back again to learn more from the people of West and North Africa. But when the war came, he was called into the Office of Strategic Services and he wondered why. You can stop wondering, Doctor. We want you in the strategic services for a job that's uh, highly confidential at the present time. Uh, can you tell me what it is? <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to. The Allied Army is planning to invade North Africa. Well, that doesn't surprise you? Yes, it does. Well, to put things plainly, we want you to help plan this North African invasion. Oh, but you're joking. I don't even know how to handle a rifle. Uh, that's what I told General Eisenhower, but... But he believes that somehow your knowledge of the peoples of North Africa will help uh, smooth the way for our troops. I think I see what you mean. Then uh, you see more than I do. I, I don't know what the general had in mind, but he told us to let you think it over and to ask you for a recommendation in 24 hours. You see, we haven't much time. He took the time. He checked his notes, remembered his talks with Africans, and the history of native tribes whose thirst for freedom was as keen as his own and he returned to the Office of Strategic Services. Gentlemen, I'm not a military man. That goes without saying. Uh, what do you consider strategically necessary for the success of the invasion? Well, I consider that the most necessary thing for the American army to learn before they invade North Africa... Yes? ...is something about the African people. Now, I'd suggest we teach each soldier something of the history and nature of the people whose land he'll be living on teach them to overcome as much as possible their prejudices and to realize that the culture of Africa and Asia is even older than his own. And in this way, I think we may be welcomed as liberators, gentlemen, and not fought as invaders. And the War Department had equipped their men who invaded North Africa with a history of its people. And when the war was near its end, he remembered how he had been sent to the San Francisco Conference to help form the United Nations and to write the 11th, 12th, and 13th chapters in the Charter on Trusteeship. And he had gone on and helped to write the United Nations Charter that declared all nations liable for the human rights of their citizens. And organizations throughout the world addressed their grievances to the United Nations. One to which he belonged presented a petition. Is Dr. Ralph Bunch here? Uh, no, but I am Henri Logier. I'm in charge of social affairs. What is it? My name is Walter White. I'm secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We understand that it's the aim of the United Nations to guarantee civil rights to all minorities in their respective countries. But yes, that is so. And we understand that it's the duty of each country to fulfill these sections of the Charter. But of course. The United States itself has petitioned to protect the rights of minorities, say, in Greece, Poland, Romania. Uh, what is your business here, monsieur? We are here to petition you to investigate the discrimination practiced against the Negro citizens of the United States. We're putting the case of 14 million Negroes in the hands of the United Nations. And he remembered helping to sponsor the Freedom Train and sending it around the nation to encourage the ideals of peace and human rights at home. He remembered he had asked the mayor of a great southern city to let the train come in. 
but some had other words for the mayor. Now, let's talk. Look here, Mayor. They call you fair and square, don't they? Yeah, that's why we came to you before taking things into our own hands. That's right. We want to give you the Now, chance. wait. Now, wait. Wait. One at a time. One at a time. What harm can a little old train do to us, Mr. Juggins? I've talked to this political scientist, Ralph Bunch, who advised me to let it in. No harm. Oh, why, this here, what do they call it? A uh, freedom train or something silly like why, that. Why, the car go on. That train is loaded. Dynamite. And you know what they intend to do? No, what? They got them Bill of Rights on there, on exhibition. Did this Ralph Bunch, did it tell you that? And they want to let Negro and white folks read them together. Imagine. Negro and white folks reading a constitution together. That'll overthrow anybody's government. For Negroes and whites to read that their constitution together in the South is it's unconstitutional. That's what it is. Mayor, you got to stop that freedom train. But what can I do? Oh, it's a Trojan horse. That's what it is. Derail the devilish thing. Get out of here. Uh, 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 gentlemen, 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 I've got it. I'm a fair and square mayor, you know that. You're right. I promised Bunch personally I'd do it. Therefore, I say this freedom train ought to be allowed to come in. Oh, I know. Oh, no, I'm not now, not wait, not wait till I finish. I hereby decree that the train can come in provided it honors our custom. Huh? To be fair, we'll let the white folks read the Bill of Rights and the Constitution on Monday and the colored folks can come in and read them on Tuesday. Anybody caught reading out of place will be put in jail. Now, how do you like that? Well, now, they sure don't call you fair and square for nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now let that freedom train roll in. Let it roll. But he remembered urging that no segregation of any individual or group of any kind on the basis of race or religion be allowed at any exhibition of the freedom train held anywhere. And the freedom train rolled on past that southern station. And he thought of the appeals for human rights that had come into his commission of the United Nations from all over the world, and of the biggest one that had come to him from the United Nations Secretary General. Dr. Bunch... Uh, yes, Mr. Lee. I'd like to transfer you from the trusteeship division to another post. You're dissatisfied with my work? No, no. Every <laughs> nation you've worked with is satisfied. Mm -hmm. But this is a job that is going to take the most experienced men we've got. I'd like you to take the post of assistant mediator of Palestine to Count Fouke Bernadotte. He thought of the first days in Palestine when he saw the slow, painful birth of a new nation of Israel forged out of the fierce furnace of suffering and the struggle of the Jewish people, and populated by survivors of the Gestapo raids and concentration camps, who built a homeland in an ancient birthplace, and had gained a foothold in a promised land. And he thought of the restless Arab nation slowly throwing off its colonial yoke, yearning to be free and strong. And he walked to a phone in Jerusalem and dialed the United Nations headquarters to give his answer. Hello? This is Ralph Bunch. Yes. Tell them I'm willing to stay on as mediator. I'll stay here until we've found a way to bring peace to Palestine. You have just heard Destination Freedom's dramatization of the story of Ralph Bunch, acting mediator for the United Nations in Palestine. Destination Freedom is written by Richard Durham and produced under the direction of Homer Heck. The role of Dr. Bunch was played by Fred Pinkard. Others were Oscar Brown, Jr., Everett Clark, Jack Lester, Ted Liss, Art McCoo, and Tony Parrish. The special music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and was played by Elwin Owen and Bobby Christian. This is Charles Chan inviting you to be with us again next week when Destination Freedom will tell the story of Paul Williams, the noted Negro architect. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.